It was Leonardo da Vinci who said many years ago, water is the driving force of nature. And uh, it certainly is a big part of the driving force of agriculture. And this panel is an important panel on water stresses and global food security and what we can do about it. And it's chaired by uh, our colleague, former Secretary of Agriculture, former Director of UNICEF, Ann Veneman. And I welcome Ann and her panel up here. Good afternoon, everyone, and uh, thanks for bearing with us all day. Thank you, Dan, for that uh, introduction. He was my immediate predecessor and left me lots of goodies in the drawer. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> but we are here really to uh, discuss an issue that's been coming up over and over again today in these panels, and that is the issue of water. Water um, is essential for life. Uh, it's essential for agriculture. It's one of the biggest challenges our food system faces. Um, as, as you heard this morning, uh, agriculture accounts for about 70% of freshwater withdrawals around the globe. And, you know, we have competing demands with a growing population from human use, energy, as more and more people around the world get access to energy, um, and as water resources will have to be better managed, particularly in agriculture. We heard that specific message today from Bill Riley, who said that management of water must be vastly more efficient. So to discuss all of this today, we have a terrific panel. I'm going to introduce them in alphabetical order, not necessarily the order they're up here. We have Jessica Edelman, uh, who is the Senior Vice President and Head of Corporate Affairs of North America for Syngenta. Lester Brown, who's the President of the Earth Policy Institute uh, and the author of more than 50 books, I think. And we discovered last night, sitting next to each other at dinner, that we both had, early in our lives, worked for the Foreign Agricultural Service. Uh, Ronnie Green. He is the Vice President of Agriculture and Natural Resources and the Har Harlan Vice Chancellor for the Institute of Agriculture and Natural Resources at the University of Nebraska. A.G. Kawamura is the Chair of Solutions from the Land Dialogue and one of my successors as Secretary of Food and Ag in the state of California. And Herbert Oberhansley, who's the Chief Economist at Nestle, based in Switzerland. So I'm going to begin with you, Herbert, about to give us a bit of an overview of water. This has been an area of focus for you. And I know that Nestle has been very involved in the World Economic Forum work mm -hmm. on water, looking at the issues of water, establishing the new center at the World Bank. Give us an overview of the global water situation and what it means for food security. Thank you, Anne, and thank you to Chicago Council for inviting me. Fascinating day up to now. So what's the situation in water? Let me take a look back first, uh, starting 1900. 600 cubic kilometer of water withdrawn, and already then, as Anne said, some 70% for agriculture. It increased to 1,400 cubic kilometers in 1950, in 2010, we were at 4,500 cubic kilometers. Now, it's a measure that won't tell you a lot. Uh, if I would uh, transform it in liters, it would tell you even more, even less because there are so many zeros. But let's compare to available water. And that's kind of a difficult concept. Water availability, you have to understand, water must be here in the right form, at the right time, at the right place. 
doesn't help a lot if there is uh, more than enough water from rain in Switzerland, when there is lack of water in the Sahara. doesn't help that much when there is a lot of water coming down during two months of monsoon in the same region of India, when then the water is lacking when farms have to uh, grow their plants. When you take all that, you get to 4,200 cubic kilometers of water that is sustainably available. And I said withdrawal already at 4,500 cubic kilometers. Where do these 300 kilometers, cubic kilometers come from? It's basically they are withdrawn from nature. You may have seen maps or even pictures of uh, RLC, of Lake Chad, all mostly because of overuse of agricult by agriculture in the affluence, uh, drying up uh, Lake Aral now maybe 15% uh, of the original surface. It's what you don't see and what is even worse, it's the overuse of underground, often fossil water. Uh, here in the US, Ogallala Aquifer, there are estimates that about half of the water that was accumulated uh, after the last ice age has been used. 250 cubic kilometers. That's for one region already uh, the, almost the whole gap mm. that you have every year. This water will be needed in case of drought because usually you would not use that water in a period when you have enough rain, but you would use it, this underground water, when you really are in a difficult situation. But it's not the case. It has been systematically used. What is the outlook? If we don't change the way we are using water today, the forecast, the scenario of this World Economic Forum group is that it will increase to 6,900 cubic kilometers in the year 2030, 60% more than is sustainably available. Nature will no longer be enough to cover that gap. So uh, the user that is using, or the, uh, the user that is withdrawing most of the water will probably be the one that also suffers most. And the scenario that we see is a 30% shortfall in cereal production due to a water shortage by 2025-2030. It's a scenario. It's, it's, as I said, if there is no change. But it's so dramatic that I think action would be very urgent. And uh, hopefully uh, that uh, after this session here also, awareness that action is necessary will increase. Well, that's a bit of a depressing scenario. <laughs> <laughs> So let's go on to Lester Brown, who's written for many years about the issues of, of environment, of food security. Talk about uh, how water fits into this equation and what you see in the future. Worldwide, at the moment, water shortages are probably the principal constraint on efforts to expand world food production. There's a lot of land out there that could produce food if we had the water to go with it. So, so water is, is emerging as, as the front and center issue. Um, we forget how much water it takes to produce food. We drink, on average, maybe, maybe five liters a day, four liters a day. But the food we eat each day requires 2,000 liters to produce or 500 times as much. So we can, we can visualize this water we drink, but it's not so easy to visualize the amount it takes to produce our food each day. Um, so the, the, the growth in world population, uh, rising affluence, all are putting more pressure on, on water supplies. One of the consequences is that um, we've long ago um, outrun the supply of surface water from rivers and building dams and so forth. Around 1950, 1960 maybe, the, the emphasis shifted to drilling for underground water. So we've been doing that now for some time and, and, and doing it on a scale that's leading to aquifer depletion. You mentioned the Ogallala, um, that happens to be a fossil aquifer. The deep aquifer under the North China Plain is also a fossil aquifer. It is being overpumped. When it's gone, it's gone. They'll go back to, to dry land farming. Um, in thinking about the things we can do in response to, to a tightening water supply, uh, one of them is in affluent societies, we can move down the food chain. 
we're living too high on the food chain for our own good to begin with as a, as a society, at least in, in, in this country. Uh, moving down the food chain not only reduces the demand for grain to produce livestock products, it also reduces the, de the demand for water. So th this is kind of a win-win situation. If we're eating too much meat, milk, and eggs, if we reduce that, that's, that's the quickest way we as individuals can actually make a difference on the, on the water uh, balance. With the irrigation systems, we have the possibility for more uh, efficient use of water. Um, we've, we've, been, we've evolved irrigation systems that were convenient and relatively easy, um, but not necessarily that we're the most water efficient. So I think we're going to have to do some rethinking here. We have flood irrigation, which takes a lot of water, obviously, and, and is frequently used with, with rice production. We have furrow irrigation. Then we have sprinkler irrigation and drip irrigation. And each of those is progressively more efficient in the, in the use of water. Um, we can think about more water-efficient crops. Um, for example, it takes roughly a um, 1,000 tons of water to produce one ton of wheat, but 2,000 tons of water to produce one ton of rice. Now, there's some places in the world where you don't really have an option, but there are large areas like North Africa and the Middle East where Egypt, for example, uh, is growing a lot of rice, but it doesn't have enough water to produce uh, the wheat it needs. Um, so in Egypt, reducing rice consumption, reducing rice production, and and increasing wheat uh, production would actually lead to a much larger grain harvest with the same, um, same supply of water. We are now seeing for the first time in, in history the decline in grain production in the uh, Arab Middle East um, as a result of a decline, a shrinking water supply. Aquifers in Saudi Arabia, Saudi Arabia Yemen, Iraq, um, uh, Syria are all being overpumped. Um, and as a result, this part of the world has already experienced peak water. Peak water is now history. And the interesting thing is if you chart peak water and then peak grain, they're only a few years apart. And, and so grain production in that region of the world has now dropped 20, maybe 30 percent over the last several years because the aquifers are being depleted and, and the irrigated area is, is shrinking. So we have, this is no longer hypothetical, we already have one reg region of the world, albeit a relatively small one, where grain production is declining as a result of a shrinking water supply. We need to think about, I think I mentioned rice versus wheat, we need to think about uh, upland rice, for example. There's not a lot of research on upland rice, but it is clearly uh, a possibility. Um, and I think we need to take inventory of our agricultural research efforts around the world and see to what extent they deal directly or indirectly with the water issue, and, and then begin to, uh, in some cases, reshape uh, the, the pattern of, of uh, investment in agricultural research in order to help us use water more efficiently. Great. Thank you so much. I, you know, just getting back to the, the Middle East importing more grain and growing less. I was in California just last week at meeting with a small seed company that has exported a lot of uh, alfalfa seed to Saudi Arabia. That, that's their largest market, bigger even than the U.S. for this seed. And uh, they said the seed exports are going down mm -hmm. and the hay exports are going up because they want the finished product. They're basically importing the water. So now I want to move on to talking about California. As was already stated in this uh, symposium today, California is suffering the worst drought in recorded history. Um, just this week, on Monday, a report came out from the University of California at Davis, which looked at the impacts of the drought on California's Central Valley. That's where I, my home area is, where I grew up on a farm. And they have estimated that the cost in lost crops and other economic impacts is $1.7 billion. This is in the Central Valley. 
More than 14,000 workers will lose their jobs, and 300,000 acres of farmland have been fallowed because of lack of water. One of the things I heard also when I've been out there is that many of these farmers are not farming their row crops because they are taking their overall water allocation and using it for their tree nuts primarily. The increase in production of almonds, walnuts, and pistachios has been growing exponentially in California. And of course, they need to keep these trees alive. So water decisions are being made, made in this drought area, and it's reducing the amount of uh, farmland that's going to be actually farmed this year. A.G. Kawamura, who uh, farms in California, not in the Central Valley, but uh, he's, he's been personally affected by the situation. Talk a little bit about what's going on and what do you think some of the solutions are? It's amazing that in our... Can we hear it? Can we hear it? It's, no. Uh -huh. It's, a, it's a amazing how quickly we can get in trouble as a large agricultural state. Uh, we had a chance in uh, 2008 to go down and visit Australia uh, in year 11 of their 12-year drought. Uh, at that time, in year 8, they had already seen their uh, rice production, wheat production, almost completely collapse. In fact, uh, we heard with some dismay that they had a 50% drop in farm gate in that, those later years. Can you imagine a 50% uh, drop in farm gate? Is this working now? 50% 50, 50 drop in farm gate in any other region of the planet. These, these, are, these are the challenges we face. And one of the issues that we, we wanted to talk about in, uh, in our, my own operation, I'm a vegetable, uh, fruit and vegetable grower, and I'm an irrigator. I turn water on and off. And if it's dry, I turn more water off. If it's uh, wet, I, I don't have to put much water out. Uh, just two weeks ago, we went through one of the hottest dry spells with uh, Santa Ana winds that I've ever been through in May, both combined at the same time. And in any normal crop, uh, if I had been a rain-fed uh, uh, farmer, I would have lost that crop. In fact, I'm farming on some old dry lima bean ground, uh, dry, dry farming lima bean ground, and we have a great crop with a new variety that's pretty well heat resistant. And I'm going to, instead of maybe having a 50, 60 percent loss, I'm going to actually harvest maybe close to 85 uh, plus percent out of this crop that I would have lost in a different scenario. Uh, we talk about how this world will need to feed itself, but I, I, as, a, as a fruit and vegetable grower that irrigates, I think what's uh, amazing to me is, uh, if it's, the numbers are still correct, over 92, 94 percent of all of Africa is rain-fed agriculture. Uh, over 80 percent in our own Midwest uh, of our agriculture is rain-fed agriculture. If you go to Australia, I think the numbers are still uh, around 90 percent of the agriculture in Australia is rain-fed agriculture. And so trying to create predictability in this outcome of uh, of growing things is, is one are two different things when you're talking to a, uh, a farmer that irrigates. Uh, we are always investing, uh, all farmers will invest in things that create more predictability in the outcome uh, of our, our endeavors. And in the case of an irrigator, we'll invest in pumps, we'll invest in, uh, as Lester said, we, we, we were one of the last in our county to go from furrow irrigation to sprinklers, from sprinklers to uh, drip irrigation. And now we're actually looking very hard at hydroponics, which also, uh, over and above drip irrigation, will save you another 50, 60, 70 percent less water per square foot per productive uh, unit. And we look at these uh, things because we're in a business to try and stay in a very urban area. I'm, I'm an edible landscaper. People laugh about that. But we lease all the ground that we farm on. Uh, in my area, I have four different water sources, two different water districts with reclaimed water. One, I'm using actually potable water, only because we can't get that line reclaimed in yet. And then we have a couple of pieces where we have well water. This year, one of the impacts that we did see immediately this spring uh, was we started to see high salt start to build up, and that's something we haven't talked about today, uh, and not many people are talking about that, but as water scarcity continues to uh, grow, you see the salts coming up, and they, you only have a few things you can do. You can buffer your water. Uh, dilution is the solution that people are always talking about, is trying to find clean water, and at the same time, you can look for salt-tolerant uh, and drought-tolerant plants. And so one of the challenges I think we're all facing in our ability to stay in business is what are the tools, what's in the toolbox for us as we move forward. And a development of infrastructure, I think, is as important as anything. Uh, we have to commit to looking at the future. California, a long time ago, built with visionary leaders a future that we could grow into. 
Now we're at the point of time where if we don't do that again very soon, we're going to have a train wreck. In fact, we all kind of know that, but we're kind of wavering between pretending ignorance and actually negligence in our, in our, in our state. And so we hope we can build out this <coughs> next half century's worth of infrastructure very soon with a vote of the public. And actually, that's one of the issues, areas uh, that we're facing today. Well, that leads into the next issue. If we need a toolbox, we've talked a lot today about technology. Um, Dr. Green, what are the highest research priorities? What are some of the most promising things on the horizon? We've actually seen a lot of things today already. Um, but what do you see from your position uh, in, a, in a major land-grant research university? Well, first of all, I guess uh, I would also let, want to add my thanks for being able to be here today and be part of this very important discussion. Congratulations to the Chicago Council on putting these two subjects in the same bucket. They needed to be there, and congratulations on doing that uh, in this forum. I, I want to provide a little bit of context up front. I think it will help you understand. Uh, my friend Howard did this this morning as well. I come from a place that is a nexus of water and a nexus of scarcity of water. The Ogallala Aquifer has already been mentioned by one of the previous panelists and the concerns about that uh, groundwater resource. Our state actually sits over the vast majority of the Ogallala Aquifer and the water in that aquifer. And we also happen to be a place that is primarily dependent on agriculture. We're the largest red meat producing state in the United States, consistently one of the top two or three in, in crop production in major crops. Uh, so water, you can see, is of obvious importance to us. This morning, I thought it was interesting. There was a little bit of discussion about um, belief in climate change. I forget exactly how the, the uh, statement was made. Um, I won't get into the conservative liberal label that uh, one of my friends mentioned this morning, but. There was reference made to whether farmers in the Midwest of the United States believe that climate variability, weather volatility, climate change is important and real. I can assure you they do. They do believe that it is real. They do believe that it is important. So much so that they encouraged us at our land grant university this last two years to significantly increase our faculty in agriculture and natural resources related specifically to water. Now to the, to the specific of the question around research priorities, we also heard a lot this morning and earlier today about how much technology we already have and how many things are already sitting on the shelf or in the toolbox, so to speak, if they could be effectively deployed economically and in a context that makes sense for them. We've made huge progress over the last number of decades in our productivity and use of water and of able, you know, the efficiency of that use of water. With that said, however, the innovation that needs to occur to address the issues we've been hearing about water scarcity from the panel needs to be ramped up considerably from what it has been in more recent years. We heard a lot about abiotic stress this morning and development of plant varieties that break the, the uh, heat tolerance threshold. Uh, we heard a lot about salinity this morning, so continuing to invest resources in identifying germplasm that is resilient under these abiotic stressors is of critical and key importance, particularly around water use efficiency uh, in those systems. One thing that's not been discussed a lot today is water use in the processing industry and the importance of focusing not just on the production sector itself, in the field, so to speak, or on the ranch, so to speak, but also in that actual processing part of the supply chain and water use that goes into that final product and how are we going to make that more efficient, how are we going to make it uh, more sustainable uh, long term. And then lastly, I guess I would close with uh, research not in the biological sphere, so to speak, but research in what we heard the previous panel talk about in terms of social innovation 
and institutional change. Water evaluation, if you live in Nebraska, is a big deal. And it currently is not well understood. And it's currently not valued in the way that perhaps we expect that it will need to be long term for our production systems. We're certainly not unique in that case where, where research and social innovation and the human dimensions of water use and valuation needs to be put up as paramount in importance as well. And I'll stop there, Anne. All very important issues. And I want to get back to some of those issues when we, when we take up the second round. Now we move on to Jessica, Jessica Adelman. Um, one of the things that uh, Syngenta has implemented is a, quote, good growth plan which involves increasing productivity by 20% without using more land, water, or inputs. So talk to us about this. It sounds like a very um, great initiative that uh, your company has engaged in. And, and tell us what you're doing with uh, reducing these, the land, water, and inputs and more productivity. Great. Thank you, Secretary Veneman. I'm delighted to talk to you all about the Good Growth Plan. And uh, I also want to thank my fellow panelists here, more than just the thorns between the two roses, I guess, here today. So uh, thank you for your points, and all of which are incredibly important when we talk about this crucial topic of water. And look, Syngenta understands, much like everybody who's here today, the importance of being able to feed the planet and do it in a way that's sustainable and going to protect it for the long haul and make sure it's there for the future generations. And when we look at what we want to do with a 20th and 21st century agriculture, we need agriculture to be science smart, climate smart, and people smart. And it's with those principles that we got together and we thought about, well, what can we do? So we're a company that sells inputs. We sell some of those seeds that were talked about this morning. I had the pleasure of sitting at lunch um, with Howard, and I didn't want to ask him, but I had to, which seeds he used, uh, that his you know, corn sprung back up in four days. Very diplomatic. He said a mixture. Um, but in my heart, I know that they were Syngenta seeds. But <laughs> so thank you for your diplomacy, though. Uh, so talking about what it is that we do, we've got these crop inputs. They their seeds and also crop protection chemicals. And we know as a company that people don't want more stuff in their food. They want to be able to feel really good about what it is that they eat. And that's what caused us to go back to the drawing board and think about what is our role as a company that wants to engage responsibly as society. And that's where we came up with the Good Growth Plan. And it's very specific. I like to think of it as the concept of one planet, six commitments. And it's one of the most comprehensive, ambitious programs that's been put out there for agriculture. And in a nutshell, there's six key topics, six commitments. One is to make crops more efficient, like the secretary just pointed out. And we are going to increase the productivity of the world's major crops by 20%, okay? And we're gonna do it without using more inputs. Now for a major inputs company to stand up and say that, you know, that, that's risky, that puts us out there. Um, but we understand, we've heard what it is that society does and doesn't want from their agriculture. The second point is we're gonna rescue more farmland. And we're gonna bring 10 million hectares back from the brink of degradation. That's a commitment we're making around the world. We're also gonna help biodiversity flourish. We're gonna take the biodiversity on five million hectares of farmlands. Now embedded in this is the topic of pollinators. That actually hasn't come up today as much as I thought it might. Um, you know, what are we doing for bee health and these important other species that are part of the biodiversity equation that make agriculture so popular? We were talking about some of the tree nuts and the almond crop in California, and these pollinators are essential. And so built into these commitments are definitely working with pollinators. We're going to empower smallholders. I loved it when we heard at lunch about the smallholder farmer, and I'm glad that that's such a focus of our conversations here today. Our plan is to reach 20 million smallholders and enable them to increase their productivity by 50%. 20 million people, 
raising their productivity by 50 percent. We hope that that's going to make a real impact in food security. Also, helping people to stay safe. We're going to train 20 million farm workers on safe labor practices. That applies here in the United States with kids and people who help out their families on the farm, as well as those girls in Africa who help out with the weeding um, and hopefully get to go to school too, thanks to some of the wonderful programs that have been put into place through some of our World Food Prize winners. And then finally, looking after every worker. We're going to make sure to look after the labor conditions in all of the supply chains in which we're a part of. Now, this one was a topic we discussed and debated hotly within our organization. And we thought, well, let's just commit to taking care of um, our own facilities and our own fields. Uh, but we thought, you know, we have to think bigger than that. And we have to make sure that the standards that we would want on our own farms and on our own facilities, we make imperative for those that we deal with in our value chain. So these are our six commitments for our one planet, and we're going to try to reach them by 2020. So we know it's not going to be easy. Um, you know, the adage in our digital world that you, if you can't measure it, it didn't happen. Uh, we understand that. So we're going to make sure that we work with NGOs and third parties to track what it is that we're doing. And we have these global reference farms that are going to help us stay on top of what it is that we are committing to and help us to measure our progress. So it's ambitious but we think we can do it with your help. That's terrific. Um, you know, one of the, the, the comments that was made this morning is it was a reference made to creating shared value, which is really a concept that's being adopted by more and more companies. Uh, it's a concept that's particularly been embraced, I think, by a lot of the, the food and ag companies. And really, how do you build value for shareholders and value for society? And I think that this Syngenta initiative uh, shows a very strong creating shared value concept in building that kind of shared value of society and share shareholders. Nestle, of course, has been a real leader also in the creating shared value initiative with Harvard and so forth. Um, and Nestle has three pillars, one of which is water. Mm -hmm. Let's talk a little bit about what you're doing in trying to address the water issues as you build shareholder value and, and value for society. Quickly before the two other pillars, one is nutrition, the second one is rural development. Uh, I think my colleague who's involved there would be also interesting to listen to uh, in the context of these uh, different meetings. But uh, the third, or not the third one, but equally important is water. What does it include? It is the responsibility, the activity of the company and uh, it was just mentioned, of course, we have to start with our own activities, uh, with our own operations. We have brought water withdrawals down from 4.5 liters per US dollar of sales 10 years ago to less than 1.5 liters. And that's relatively small. I think we should be one of the leaders uh, in the food industry. Clearly, when you compare to other sectors, uh, for instance, pulp and paper, with several hundred liters per US dollar of sales, this is not big anymore. But still, we do a maximum. We work with the farmers. Uh, there can be uh, more water efficiency like you outlined, uh, Lester. There can also be uh, the uh, transformation of manure in so-called biochesters into some gas for uh, household cooking and then the dry fertilizer because you have also to see the, uh, the the, the, the second part of water use, uh, the, the wastewater disposal. We do then uh, projects where we help with, uh, with drilling, uh, drilling wells, because our interest in water is, of course, starts with the water for agriculture, but then we have a lot of products that need safe water to be prepared, uh, soups, sauces, spices, uh, also milk powder. So we are in water along the, milk uh, the, the, the value chain, along the usage chain of the food, because it's in our interest. But then comes in a factor where we have to be modest. We are by far the biggest food company in the world, and that sounds very big. But then you compare with the total market. The total market is about 10% of world GDP, which means that as the biggest, we have some 1.5% market share. And here, 
whatever we take as initiative, we understand that we need partnership, that we need public-private partnership, and we have to understand at what level that we are acting. As part of this, our chairman has initiated the 2030 Water Resources Group. It is now hosted here at IFC in the World Bank. And here the approach is that we look at watershed by watershed. I mentioned before there is no global water issue. It is different from watershed from river basin to river basin. You look what the gap is, you try to understand how big that gap will be in uh, 2030 because you don't want to solve the situation today when you see a dynamic that makes it even worse. And then you look at the levers, how to, how to close the gap in the most effective, in the most cost effective way. But then it's not a plan that we are setting up. It cannot be a plan of a group of multinational companies or, or intergovernmental organization to be imposed on people in a river basin, but we ask the government there to use these tools that we propose and set up a strategy to close the gap as soon as possible. And then, of course, again comes in our responsibility. So uh, creating shared value is also understanding where we should be active ourselves and there are a number of areas and where we have to be a partner, a loyal partner under the leadership of others. Because uh, in a watershed, uh, I mentioned the falling water tables. We started uh, the water activity in, uh, in a watershed in the, in the north of India, in Punjab. Water tables are falling one meter per year. And we talk to the farmers, because we have a milk factory there, we are using the milk from these farmers. They said, of course we know that we are destroying our livelihood. But individual farmers tell you, if I'm not pumping up, the neighbors, the neighboring villages will pump up anyway. So for these farmers, if you don't come with a solution for the whole river basin, the whole watershed, they will tell you, uh, go somewhere else if you tell them you have to become, you are water su uh, milk supplier of Nestle, you have to become the most water efficient supplier. They want to have something that really works. So this is our standing of shared value with the different levels, own responsibility, and then the understanding where we have to fit in strategies of others. And as I said, under the leadership of our chairman who was very involved in that. Great. I want to move now to um, follow up on some of the issues that have come up during the discussion today. Um, we've heard several panels refer to the need to price carbon. And in the last panel we heard again about pricing water and that it's not quite as easy. But I want to ask for the panel's reaction to this whole issue of should we be managing resources differently? Should we be pricing water differently, given that agriculture uses 70% of fresh water around the world? Um, how should we be addressing this issue? Who wants to start? Lester? I think I first wrote about pricing carbon in 1993. Um, so it's not a, not a new issue. Um, I've, I've come, to th I've come to think, however, that it's not an issue that I want to spend much time on. And the reason is because I don't think it's going to happen. Um, we're, we're now beginning to see the market beginning to drive the energy transition, for example, from, from oil and coal to uh, solar and wind. We're seeing this rather dramatically with uh, rooftop solar installations. Um, they have now become cheap enough that in many, in many parts of the country, a rooftop solar installation can provide electricity at a lower cost than the local utility is. And so what's, what's happening is that um, as more and more rooftop installations go in, the, the market for the utility begins to shrink and the utility has to raise its prices, further encouraging more people to, to invest in their own rooftop installation. So it's become a death spiral for utilities. Um, one of the, and it's not just in this country, I think it was uh, RWE in, uh, in Germany, um, or you know, I've forgotten which, which one it was, but they had to write off $3.7 billion last year because their market was shrinking but they still have to maintain the same customer infrastructure. 
So we're, we're looking at a, a situation now where the market is driving massive, massive change. Um, and what it's translating into for utilities um, is what's become known as the, the death spiral. Because once their market begins to shrink and they start raising prices, then that process just feeds on itself. So I think we're going to see uh, a lot of market-driven change in the transition from fossil fuels to solar and, and wind energy. Wind is now coming in under, under, under natural gas in, in, in many parts of this country. Um, China, uh, we haven't heard much about China today. China is building six wind mega complexes, each of which will have at least 10,000 megawatts of generating capacity. Think 10 nuclear power plants in each of these complexes. The largest one is being built, it's already under construction in Inner Mongolia. When it is complete, it will have 38,000 megawatts of generating capacity. That's enough to satisfy the needs of a country like Poland. I mean, we're seeing a scaling up in, in, uh, with wind energy that we've never seen before in the energy sector. I mean, we've never thought about a 20,000 megawatt nuclear complex or a coal-fired complex. So we're, we're, in, we're in an extraordinarily dynamic period. And my own sense is that we're going to see 50 years of change squeezed into, the, into this next decade, the next 10 years. I think we're going to see change at a pace and on a scale that we've never seen before. I mean, it took a long time to get from wood to coal and coal to oil, um, but this transition is going to be, be very fast, and, and it's, going to leave, it's going to leave a lot of uh, stranded assets, again, on a scale we've not seen before. Coal plants are not worth anything anymore, for example, in, in, in some places. So it's going to be an extraordinarily dynamic period in economic terms, and I don't think we've yet quite grasped how fast it's going to happen. Anybody else you know, want to comment on the, yeah, on the price, pricing of water? Or? Yeah, I would like to say that there's a, in California, there's a great pricing market that exists all, all the time. And it's really driven by energy, cost of energy pushing water around the state. So where we farm down in Southern California, um, those agencies that have realized that they may someday not have Colorado River or water coming from north have started to invest in tremendous amount of systems to utilize the water they get when it comes and how it comes, both reclaimed and capturing water. Uh, I agree with Lester. The changes that we're seeing, though, are remarkable because if you look at the problem about water on the planet, it's not that we don't have water on the planet. It's not even that we don't have fresh water. We have salty water. We have a lot of it. We have a lot of water in the atmosphere, and these new technologies driven by passive energy or efficient energy systems are, are partly what we're starting to see everywhere. I see little membrane um, uh, reverse osmosis uh, filter systems that are on wheels being wheeled in and out of different uh, greenhouses these days, and suddenly this idea that the California or the U.S. Uh, vine ripe tomato industry is now 40 percent hothouses, whether it's in Canada or it's North America actually, or in Arizona, these new systems fuel and utilized and utilizing new technologies is creating an enormous change in where we're at. Um, what we don't have is a regulatory system with any imagination uh, allowed it. Uh, I think one of the biggest challenges we have is our regulatory systems must be given some, some, uh, 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 some ability to create flexibility with how they perceive they need to regulate. Because what we're seeing is the early adopters and the early adapters are actually getting shut down or stalled or pushed out of business because they have to cross so many barriers just to get these new technologies into place and up and running. There's no incentivization for new thinking, for new technologies as well. And what we hope to see out of a farm bill or out of any number of energy policies is a continued incentivization for new systems, uh, that old technology, that old term that was called permaculture in the 50s and 60s, uh, I think that's where we're headed. People are talking about how everybody's going to migrate to these mega cities. Well, if you have a food shed, watershed, energy shed, well adapted, very closed systems that are very efficient, very, very smart uh, in regions around the planet, who, who wants to migrate to a mega city? You can visit the mega city, but you're going to start to see very nice systems set up uh, where you have all these different things in play. The, the challenges of waste, which uh, uses a lot of water. We know that within another couple of decades, waste will be a, a term of the 20th century, and people will laugh and say, oh, you, we threw away a lot of things in our day, but we're not doing it anymore, because why would you when it has so much value? So pricing is, is uh, things that we value is always there, and, and when it's scarce, uh, it costs more. When you start creating abundance, 
uh, whether it's abundance of water or abundance of energy, there's a lot of people that don't want that to happen because their core business is threatened. Uh, as we start to see abundance of water created on farm, whether it's atmospheric water harvest, whether it's uh, just circular systems that reuse the water over and over on your own, your own farm, these start to create uh, opportunities, but also some liabilities. So I think what's exciting is we have to, you know, Mark Twain said, if you, you can't trust your judgment if your imagination is out of focus, right? We have got to allow ourselves to have an imagination of what the 21st century is going to look like, leave that 20th century mentality behind, and embrace some of these great changes that are, uh, are, are coming online as fast as we can imagine. So I 100% agree with where Lester is saying. We're seeing so many new need advances in this squeezed, shortened time. Anybody else on pricing? Yeah, the, the only thing I would add is I uh, brought up water evaluation and, you know, earlier in comments is uh, relates somewhat to what you were just saying. The incentive that's there today, so if you're a large irrigator and you're pumping groundwater for that irrigation system, the incentive today is largely around energy use, just as you just said. So if there is a way for me to pump less water or a way for me to get that energy more efficiently to pump that water, that's what's driving the system today. We have, we have this system in Nebraska called the Nebraska Agricultural Water Demonstration Network. It's run by one of our faculty that now has 1,200 farmers in it spread across the state who are deploying soil moisture sensors to regulate their irrigation system so that they put on less water, you know, when it's needed, you know, time right, water smart uh, approaches. Sounds simple, sounds common sense, but not that easy to deploy in a dispersed industry uh, where people are just pumping water out of the aquifer. Um, so it's, the incentives today are largely around energy. I would agree with both what um, both, both speakers have said. Did you want to the, yeah, uh, I think one has to distinguish two components in uh, what, the, what, water, what the water price might be. One part is what you somehow mentioned, is the infrastructure, is the energy cost. But then there is a value of the water per se. And one of the best examples that I know is coming from Oman, that's uh, the very uh, east, uh, southeast of, uh, of the Saudi Arabian Peninsula. Just to say before, it's a system that has been working for four and a half thousand years, so it is sustainable. That's, that's about the best proof. How what did they do? They first built, it's the village that boasts the irrigation structure that finds water in the mountains, leads it in tunnel to the village. Then first, it's free water for drinking, also for people who are passing by, free water for, uh, the, 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 uh, for the mosque, for the, uh, for the washing, for the ceremonial washing there, and then it becomes private property, and this private property is tradable among farmers. So if one farmer during a month or so doesn't need his water, he sells it to another farmer. If he has an idea to invest in uh, more efficient irrigation, he sells it permanently and finances his... Uh, uh, his uh, only new irrigation scheme. And uh, I've never seen an area where water has been used so efficiently. And I can tell you it's, it's tough to use wa or to, uh, to find water there. They produce among the best, the highest value dates that I know. So uh, it is something, you are absolutely right, something that works. Not the price that is imposed from the outside by the government, but is found by the farmers. And also, very important, a price that fluctuates over time. When you look at this price within the same watershed, it fluctuates in an order of magnitude 1 to 12. Because during one part of the season, the water is much less value. Water during the night has a different value than water during the day. And this is done by the farmers among themselves. Doesn't need government. That's a fascinating thing. Um, moving on to another issue that we've heard a lot about over the course of the discussion today, and that is smallholder farmers. Mm -hmm. And the fact that they produce a significant amount of the world's food. And if they had even basic systems of irrigation and other technologies, we could increase that production significantly and help to address the need to produce so much more food as we approach the middle of this century. So talk a little bit about, uh, Jessica, you mentioned today um, smallholder farmers in, in the initiative of Syngenta. Why don't you start us off with it? And I'd like to hear anybody's thoughts on what do you think can be done 
in this space around the smallholder farmers. Mm -hmm. Great. Well, I'll actually build on the last set of conversations we were having with water and valuation as a segue into this. And, you know, we talk a lot about the value of water, and I think sometimes we mistakenly only talk about what is the market value or market price of water. I mean, maybe one day in our lifetime we'll see something like a world water exchange. Who knows? It could be just around the corner. What I think is interesting to look at, and this is where it segues into the smallholder farmer, is the idea of the hidden costs of water. And I just was you know, cruising my Facebook last night, and a friend of mine had posted this really interesting new technology. You mentioned irrigation technologies. So this is called a water wheel. And maybe you all have heard of it, but it's a little hand-pushed, item that um, has a wheel that carries 50 liters of water versus the average five liters that women in sub-Saharan Africa and other developing countries are used to transporting on average here and there to be able to do what it is that they need to do as smallholders and to feed their families. And the statistics there were that, you know, 200 million hours a day is spent fetching water. Now think about if you could harness that intellectual capital and use it differently, rather than trudging from point A to point B, moving water. What, what would that look like? And last night we had a wonderful quote um, Pamela Anderson from the Gates Foundation gave us where she said she had three words when it came to smallholders and agriculture. And the three words were women and girls. And I told her I was going to steal that, and I, I went ahead, I, I asked permission, and she said, go ahead. But I really think that that is so much of the answer, and I'm so pleased that it's been coming up repeatedly today. Because look, if we, if we had those 200 million hours back, uh, the average person, I guess, spends 35 hours a week moving water in this capacity. Now that's almost a work week, it's almost two work weeks in some regions of the world, but uh, this is how we could take this underutilized capacity and this intellectual capital and redeploy it. So that's one example on a very, very small level of irrigation technologies. Syngenta, we deal on that level and then we deal on the very large level. Uh, we have a technology that we use here in the States. It's a system, it's called the Water Plus Intelligent Irrigation Platform, where we use use the abiotic stress seeds, the um, drought resistant seeds, plus crop protection inputs, plus agronomy, but then also the actual um, applicators, the, the water um, systems. And we use pivots. So you can actually be on your cell phone, your smartphone, be at your kid's soccer game, or be at the grocery store shopping the aisles and actually change your pivot from row six to row seven. Now that's a pretty futuristic view. And so dealing with things on that level where, you know, we have macro economies that where we feed the world, such as the productivity of the U.S. farmer, but then being able to take that down to the level of the smallholder farmer and translate that type of intellectual capital in itself into results that are going to make people successful and productive. Others want to comment on the smallholder. You know, I, I love saying this because I'm a fruit and vegetable grower, but man cannot live on bread alone. Uh, he needs fruits and veggies and other, other things to eat. And when you see the amount of production that can come off of a small uh, a piece of ground uh, in terms of tonnage per acre uh, when you're growing fruits and veggies, and if you have a chance at going back to irrigated agriculture to get second crop off in a year, uh, these are huge numbers. Uh, the marketplace for fruits and vegetables, you basically, obviously, if they're perishable, you need an infrastructure in place to bring them into a central market. You look at the way California, I, I'm a little California-centric, I'm sorry, but mm -hmm. it's, it's uh, the place where we grew up. But my, my grandfather was a, share, a sharecropper in the L.A. area, and um, you looked at that market develop where you had a central uh, uh, terminal market, uh, a farmer's market, if you will, a large where a wholesale market where growers from all over the area could bring their product in. There was uh, some infrastructure early on for um, for uh, transportation infrastructure, for refrigeration. Once you build those, it, it sets up the marketplace for a lot of small uh, shareholder growers to participate in a very important market that it will exist wherever you're close to any large population area. And so putting those together, you obviously then have to str strategize 
on those pieces, find the location, find the, the willing partners that can bring that to happen. But pretty quickly overnight, you find that you can create products, and I, well, let's not say overnight, but a quick growing season, you can move into crops that have tremendous more value. And, and if you've added some, uh, some amount of irrigation, you've increased at least somewhat the predictability of that outcome, which allows them to have a chance for that. But we're, obviously, we're, we can't, not enough time to talk about all the things you need, crop tools, all the rest. But these are certainly exciting times then for how uh, nutrient-dense products can be started to really be brought into a part of the solution set for ending hunger uh, all over. Lester, did you want to add to that? No. Um, let's talk a little bit more about some of the promising technologies. And some of these actually get to this nutrition part that you've mentioned, that Lester mentioned on needing to eat lower down the food chain. Mm -hmm. Last year at this conference, we had a speaker who was doing 3D printed meat. And one of the, th the, the parts of this discussion was the fact that it will be much more environmentally sustainable, even though it will be made out of basically meat um, cells and so forth, but they'll be grown in a Petri dish, therefore not using mm -hmm. all the water and so forth. Since then, we've seen a lot of discussion about um, things that are being funded in the Silicon Valley to create animal-like products that are being produced in a laboratory that will replicate the feel and the taste of meat, but will be made from vegetable protein. I think the Gates Foundation is funding some of this research. Um, but there are many technologies that may not be directly related to water, but actually if they became large scale, and this is where some of the research is going now, it would save a lot of environment and in, in, uh, environmental and water impact. I, I, I didn't know if anybody, maybe Dr. Green, you'd like to comment on some of these sort of. Well, um, coming from the cattle state, <laughs> number one, um, I, I guess, I think you asked I, the wrong person. Yeah, I, sorry. I, I'm going to take a little different tack, and then you can go back to your original you go question. Go next, Lester. Um, one one of the things that often is left out of the discussion. I will tell you my bias. I'm a cattle geneticist professionally by background myself. That's what I spent my life doing is improving cattle genetics. Uh, we are also in the age of technology where those industries have huge opportunities to innovate themselves in ways that will make them more environmentally sustainable. Uh, things like, for instance, re-engineering the gut of the rumen. And we can begin to really think about doing that today in a way that we weren't able to do before. So sorry to get you off track, but I just couldn't miss that opportunity to throw that in. Uh, that's not off track. I just, I did it as sort of, you know, let's look at all the technology that's out there. There, may, there are many, many types of things. But Lester, maybe you want to, since you brought up this issue of, of eating lower down the food chain. Yeah, what we've seen in this country over the last, I guess, seven years now is a decline in per capita meat consumption. And that's importantly beef, but even, uh, even includes uh, poultry. Um, and I think part of this is for health reasons. I think we realize we're eating a lot of meat and, and, uh, and uh, uh, fatty uh, products uh, in, our, in our diet. Uh, I also notice that um, young people have a different uh, set of food values than our generation has. They're much more uh, vegetable, uh, oriented, less meat oriented. I mean, for my generation, if you had gotten a promotion or something and wanted to celebrate, you went out and had a steak dinner. I mean, that was, that was a given, you know, it was, uh, but young people don't think in those terms. Now they go out and eat a quinoa dinner. <laughs> <laughs> right. Quinoa was, was the word. Um, it's a joke. The, um, so, so we're seeing a cultural shift here that I think is, has the effect of, uh, over time, moving us down the food chain, which is probably, um, which is, is good for us and, and also, I think, good, good for the planet. And it also frees up some land and water resources to raise consumption in parts of the world that need 
uh, very much need more, more consumption. I think this is a great question. If you look at disruptive technologies, and some of the really interesting ones that got my attention lately uh, is the idea, can we produce animal feed in the petri dish? I mean, because if you look at so much of what row crops and large production agriculture goes to fuel, it's the animal feed industry. So this is where you get the compound effects that take so many of our inputs and put them to, to use. So that was one that I thought was really interesting. I'm in the middle of reading this great piece in this week, I believe it is, this week's New Yorker on the Soylent, which is a Silicon Valley entrepreneur type, decided that food was sort of you know, just kind of a bother, frankly. He wanted to be coding or something at his computer constantly. And he basically put together a sludgy cocktail of amino acids and other ingredients that he's been living on for a year and a half. So I guess it works. But um, I think it takes away a little bit of the joy of living. But I guess if you're just coding away and only keep up with your friends on Facebook and you don't need to go to a meal. It, it works for Silicon Valley. So um, that was one that I thought was really interesting. And um, then I think the other ones that come into play tend to be around um, changing just the patterns. And what are the, what are the social norms uh, about going out and eating and what do people eat? So it's really, it's a great topic. It's one that could radically change the face of this industry. Now, that said, uh, people have a very strong emotional relationship to their food as well. And are you going to, does everybody want to, to drink a, a sludgy mixture over a computer every night and every morning and every day at lunch? Probably not. But the more we start thinking about where could mm. some of these macro disruptions and interesting new technologies and thinking completely differently about how we're going to feed the nine billion come into play. I think it's great. And look, I love a steak just as much as the next person. But, you know, I was thinking a lot about what Lester said as we head out into Memorial Day weekend. And frankly, you know, your, your hamburger that you might have this weekend is 2,400 liters of water. Now, that's probably more water than, than the pool you're going to swim in this weekend, um, not the ocean you'll go to the, for the beach. But these are things that if, until we start understanding the, the different um, ratios out there, that one liter goes to one calorie of food. And that's a pretty big number, frankly, if you start adding that up. So uh, it starts with us. And it starts with governments, it starts with individuals and society, and it starts with companies uh, like Syngenta and our Good Growth Plan. And so it's really an interesting time. So do you want to call it? Yeah, I think we have to think about the consumer as well. And uh, you, you mentioned it, uh, food is, is somewhat emotional. First, reducing meat in our areas, be it US, be it Europe, be it some other areas, that's an urgent thing, it's for the health. It's for the environment. It's a, it's a no-brainer. It's a win-win. It's a win-win. But at the same time, we should remember that uh, in developing countries, meat consumption is still very low. They may be in the 50, 60, or 70 grams per day. Uh, US, New Zealand, France, they are in the 400 grams, just that you have a relation. So you cannot expect people in the developing countries to stay with a bowl of rice per day they have the right to ask for some chicken, maybe even saw some beef from time to time. By no means should they go up to the, to the, 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 the average that we have in, uh, in the West. That's very clear. But this increase will continue, and this increase, even if it's modest, it's usually one or two grams per day in average, by the large number of people has much more weight than what we are reducing. So we should expect that there still an increase is taking place. That's why I came to, or I became with the uh, estimate to this 6,800, 6,900 cubic kilometers. On the specific point that you mentioned, we did a number of research projects. For instance, in the 1960s, 70s, we tried to transform fuel into food. And you know, today it goes the other way around, which would also be a subject to be discussed here, but probably leave it out. But transforming, uh, uh, producing proteins out of, uh, out of petrol. And it was something that works very well. We also tried to uh, create some artificial meat based on soy. 
But the consumer doesn't like it. <laughs> consumer feels that, and, and we are good in marketing. Don't underestimate our marketing. <laughs> uh, it's not, no, one has to be realistic. As soon as there is the impression of, in German, the word is ersatz, replacement, they, 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 they don't want it. So, uh, uh, of course, we will make other efforts, especially soy-based products. In the case of milk, combining milk with soy, there are a lot of opportunities, and we will continue to push for it. But uh, one should accept some, uh, some emotions and, uh, and some, some gut feelings on the consumer side. Uh, it's the reality out there, and that's good, the idea that we have at Nestle and our engineers have, and not all of them fly. <laughs> okay, we're, we're running out of time, and so, because Secret Secretary Vilsack's on his way, I just got a note. So, AG, I'm going to let you comment on this question, and then I want each of you in one sentence to say, with regard to addressing the water issue and food, what would be the one thing you say is most important to address? So let's... And I'll link my question, my, yeah. that question with my yeah. answer here is that um, currently we're seeing reclaim water uh, systems all over, the, all over the world and all over the country. Um, one of the great systems that, that's taking place is they're using in, in our waste management system nearby, they have a, high, a, a, a waste system digester that's then splitting off the, the methane coming out of the human waste digester uh, and running fuel cells to help running the, the plant, which then is cleaning up the water with a, a tertiary treatment. And if you add the ultraviolet light to this system, actually you end up with potable water that's fully drinkable. And so what we're seeing is as a new sources of water on the planet, if countries are going to build sewer systems, if they go down that that path as opposed to dry systems, which is another conversation for another day. But if they're building or they already have these systems in place, this idea that we're not going to have waste on the planet anymore, that needs to be ramped up. That can be ramped up in uh, whether it's uh, systems for digesters for waste food that can digest mm. and give you some great compost and they're, mm -hmm. they're run passively or not. These are the exciting things that are taking place. Mm -hmm. So taking waste, creating new water based out of water that you previously were throwing away, that, that's an immediate source for folks that might want to be smallholders, shareholders that might want to grow around an urban area uh, or in that urban forest and grow great products. Great. Uh, Jessica. Okay. Hashtag global ag. <laughs> Something needs to change. It's time to rethink hashtag water. <laughs> great. Green. Water is the new oil, is the way I would say it, first of all. And secondly, I think we heard it clearly this morning. Might surprise you that based on the discussion that I'm going to say this, but we have to address the water lost in food waste in the system. Hmm. Herbert? There is comparison between water withdrawals for agriculture and the physiological need of plants. The water withdrawals are 250% of the physiological needs. So there is enough room to save water to solve this uh, problem that we, see in, uh, that we see coming. And Lester, I'm giving you the last word. Um, we talked about photosynthesis. It is the most efficient technology we have for converting water and CO2 into edible products. On the water issue, the most important thing we can do if we want to save water is to move down the food chain, simply because 80 percent of all the water we use is, is for irrigation. Well, I want to thank this p terrific panel. I think it's been a great discussion. I want to thank the audience for uh, listening. And uh, we will now turn the, the podium back over to Dan Glickman.